Good morning, everybody. This morning, I woke up with such determination to share some things. And I am certain that you will be fired up and encouraged by the end of this. I'm going to go first to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. Yesterday, I highlighted something very important. I don't know how many of you really grasped it. Okay, because in these videos, it's important sometimes to listen and then listen again so that you're able to capture everything that was being shared. Amen. One such thing was when I said you feel stuck and you feel like you are in survival mode because you don't understand sonship. So let's start right there. This talks about sonship in Christ. This is so fundamental. All right. Galatians chapter four. Just a few verses. I'm going to read from verse 4 onwards. But when the proper time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem and liberate those who are who are under the law, that we might be adopted as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And remember, the spirit of his son, what, what is he doing? He's crying out, Abba, Father. Which means that not one of us can say that, oh, I just don't have the desire or the ability, you know, to require the Lord as my greatest need. No. Because you have the very spirit of the living God. You have his spirit, spirit of the son on the inside of you. And he is crying out, Abba, Father. Okay? Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then also an heir through God. You are also an heir. This part right here. So many people struggle with this. They will argue with people who read this, who believe this. This has become a conviction for them. They will argue with them. You say something like, look, we're heir. That means that whatever belongs to him is mine. Now people say, no, humble yourself. You can't say such a thing. He's God. You're not. Go back and read this again. I'm sorry if this is coming across. What's wrong with her? You Well, she woke up on the wrong side of the bed today. No, no, she did. She didn't. <laughs> All right. You got to understand this, believers, because you are his sons. Do you believe that? That's step one. If you do believe that, you have to believe the second part of this too. If you're a son, you're also an heir through God. That means through Christ, you are also an heir. But at that time when you did not know God and were acquainted with him, sorry, unacquainted with him. This is talking about before, before you became a son, All right? You were slaves. To those things which by their very nature were not and could not be gods at all. But that is not the case now. Now you are a son and, a, and an heir. Now, however, since you have come to know God. And remember, every time you see the word know, this is by experience. Now, however, since you have come to know God or rather to be known by God, how is it that you are turning back again to the weak and worthless elemental principles to which you want to be enslaved all over again? And he goes into a bunch of those philosophies and, and uh, worthless principles. He talks about what these things are. Um, and this is something that Paul admonishes the church with time and time again. He says, you started off in the spirit. Why are you going back to trying to do this life with your own strength? And he calls that foolishness. All right. Now, remember the prodigal son's story. The younger son asked, asked the father, father, give me what is mine. Did the father say, no, I won't give it to you because you're going to go and waste it all? No, he gives it. He gave it all to the son. He wasted it all, returned, and the father received him and still put the ring on his finger, the shoes on his feet, and the robe, which represents a robe of righteousness. He did this in the presence of all the people, his servants, and everybody watching to see, ooh, what's going to happen now? He made a public declaration that you are my son, and you are still, you are my heir. 
Okay? And he says, everything that is mine is yours. That's what he said to somebody who took, who said, give me what is mine. Not, may I please have a part of what is mine? No. Give me what is mine. I'm leaving. I can do this life on my own. He gives it all to him. What about the older son? He watches this party being thrown for this younger son and, and he says, oh, I've been working for you all these years. You haven't given me anything. Where is my party? You know? And the father says to him, son, don't you know that everything that is mine is yours? Same thing. Both those sons didn't understand who they were and what was theirs. How amazing it is to live in the father's house as a son and as an heir. Are you catching this? This is how a lot of believers are today. You're either like the youngest son or the oldest son. But this is what I, this is the, the, the takeaway. There's so much we can learn from that story. So much about sonship that we can learn from that story and about righteousness and this new life in Christ from that one, one story. But today, I want to I want to remind you: if that younger son who wasted it all asked his father for for everything that belonged to him, and the father, you know, didn't didn't think twice, he gave him everything that belonged to him. Because yeah, it belongs to you. Fine, take it. How much more today, as a spirit born, born again, son? You, I'm talking about you. How much more will God not give you what is yours? Do you think he's holding back anything? Ephesians chapter 1. Thank you, Lord. Grace and peace. Grace and peace. This is what I'm also praying for you. Grace and peace to you. From God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed and worthy of praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ. Every spiritual blessing. Just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world so that we would be holy. We would be holy. It's a state of being so that we would be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, in love, he predestined and lovingly planned for us to be adopted to himself. He planned this. We're all part of his plan, you know, a part of this amazing major plan done in love. He lovingly planned all of this, planned for you to be adopted to himself as his own children through Jesus Christ in accordance with the kind intention and good pleasure of his will. To the praise of his glorious grace and favor, which he so freely bestowed on us in the beloved. He freely bestowed. Go back to the story of the prodigal son. What did the father do? What was his response? In him, we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness and complete pardon of our sin in accordance with the riches of his grace which he lavished on us. He lavished his grace on us. Now, did you see that? We have complete forgiveness and pardon of our sin. What is that sin, singular? Understand this, my brothers and sisters. When you think of sin, you're thinking of the uh, symptoms of sin. Okay? So you think of those individual sins, such as stealing, killing, this, that, you know, lying, adultery, all those type of things. Those are symptoms. But what is the sin? The sin is straying away from God. It's a condition of our heart where man thinks just like this is what happened with Lucifer. Iniquity was found in him is what the scriptures say. Iniquity was found in him. So who created that? Did Satan create sin? People say this. Christians say this. I've heard this teaching before. Oh, you know, Satan is the uh, originator. I mean, he created sin and all this. No, he, he can't create anything. You do know that. Lucifer did not create it. Iniquity was found in him. It's a condition of the heart. Yeah. And then all these individual sins that you can think of, it's what happens when you stray away. It's what happens when that's a condition of your heart. I don't want to stray away from this. But are you, get, are you, are you, are you capturing this? Okay. Which he lavished on us in all wisdom and understanding. 
in all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ with regard to the fulfillment of the times to bring all things together in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth. There's some deep truths in this. I don't want to go into those deep truths right now because there's something I, I want to bring your attention to. All right. In him also we have received an inheritance. Having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works everything in agreement with the counsel and design of his will. So that we who are who were the first to hope in Christ would exist to the praise of his glory. You exist to the praise of his glory. Listen, remember, you are part of his wonderful good plan. All right. Everything that he planned in love. Do you understand this, my brothers and sisters? And he is being glorified when we realize, when we come into the realization of all these things. It's no longer a mystery. He keeps saying this. The mystery has been revealed. It was a mystery to the people in the past, but no longer is it a mystery. So believers need to quit saying things like some things we will never understand. So everything that you don't understand, you say, oh, well, it, you know, it's just how it's supposed to be. It's a mystery. It's a mystery revealed. So because of our ignorance or our pride or whatever the reason is, we're so stubborn sometimes in our ways that we just we just explain everything that we don't know. Everything that we don't, you know, I don't know. It's a mystery. Wow. I don't, it's a mystery. <laughs> you can't just explain things away like that. Just calling it a mystery. It's a mystery revealed. He made known to us what that is. And that's for a reason because you need to know who you are and what you have. My brothers and sisters, you have a whole storehouse on the inside of you. Do you know that? So when the Bible says... There's a storehouse in your heart and you bring the good things out of that storehouse. If I were to ask you right now, do you know you have a storehouse? Some of you would go, mm, I don't know. I have a storehouse? And others, you may say, yes, I know I have a storehouse. Okay, well, do you know what's in that storehouse? Do you know all the things that have been stored in your storehouse? Do you have anything in there? Or when trouble comes is, is when you go, oh, let me, let me quickly gather some things and put it in my storehouse right now. No. Because as you go through life, you'll see, you know this already. If you're living, you know that there could be things happening. There's going to be somebody who needs healing, whether that's you or somebody around you, or maybe a total stranger. Like Peter, you know, he's just walking along and somebody is begging and he's like, I, I don't have what you think you need right now. Silver and gold, I don't have. But what I do have, I, I can give you that. I'm giving it to you right now. Can you do that? Can you pull that thing, that good thing out of your storehouse just when it's necessary? Because there's something on the inside of me. It keeps arising. The closer and closer I get to the Lord, there's this thing that, that, that uh, keeps stirring up on the inside of me. And I just want to keep pulling out these things out of me when I need it. If it's not available for me, what is the point? But the Lord keeps telling me, and this is why, you know, my life has changed completely because of this knowledge that he's told me, no, but it is available to you. Huh? It is. It is. Light bulb goes off. Otherwise, if somebody comes to me for help, I have nothing to give you. I can maybe kind of motivate you for five minutes and then maybe you'll go back to your same old issues. What good is that? There's always going to be somebody in need around you, whether it's you or somebody else. Somebody who needs increase, a breakthrough, uh, provisions, whatever. They need a quick answer, immediate answer. Okay. It can't just be, well, I think it might be good to do this. Or, you know, you can try A. If that doesn't work, you can go for B. If that doesn't work, you can go for C, option C. That It's just not going to work. Some people are in situations where they need an answer now. They need to respond to something. Maybe, I don't know what it is. Like, you know, some kind of a situation that they're in that demands an answer, a solution right away. Are we able to pull that out of our storehouse and give it to them? We're meant to be light. Just as he is light, we're meant to be light in this world. You think there's nothing in your storehouse? Then God is lying. We can all just pack up because God is lying probably. And he's, this is just, this is all fake. Do you think? Come on. Thank you, Jesus. You are loaded, but you feel so depleted. That can't be. Something is missing. Something is off somewhere. But it can be fixed. That's the good news. You feel miserable right now because your eyes are off the gospel. 
which you once heard, which is a gospel of peace. It is the power of God to save. Your eyes have strayed away from the gospel, my brother and sister. Now, that gospel, which saved you, your eyes have strayed away from it. You are loaded. When you know what you have and you use it, you will no longer play defense. You will be on the defensive side of things. You will take things by force. This is what it looks like. This is how you do violence in your spirit. Matthew 6, verse 11. I'll post it here. Where Jesus says, Since the time of John the Baptist, the kingdom of God suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Let me try to explain it in a very simple way. It's exactly what I'm talking about today. People at that time, even in, even when they were listening to John the Baptist's message that he was preaching before Jesus came along, people were flocking around him to listen to his message. You know he had followers, right? Likewise, Jesus is now on the scene. And there are people surrounding him, you know, always, you know, around him, wanting to listen to his words because his words were giving them life. You see, that's the gospel. And, and, and so there is a earnest seeking that happens, and that is the violence. You know, the one of the bestest way <laughs> to really understand that verse is in Luke chapter 5. You see the story of the paralyzed man in Luke chapter 5, and uh, read from verse 17 onwards. He couldn't move, right? There were some men who they brought him laying on a bed they decided you know what since he can't walk over there to jesus on his own let's take him there so they lay him down brought him down and lay him down in front of jesus the determination that they had all right was this that we need to take him to jesus we need to be he needs to be where jesus is then he'll be okay are you tracking with me here their eyes were set on Jesus. That's where he is. There are all these people around here. All these entrances are closed or, you know, they're blocked by all these people. That's okay. But we need to be where Jesus is. So let's get him down from a hole in the roof. Ah, so, so, so when when from your vantage point maybe you're saying this door is closed and that door is closed and this door is closed and then there's all these people here and then there's all these people and this is happening and this is happening and oh i just i can't be there you know it's not for me and i can never get that but these guys they took it by force this is what it looks like to do violence in your spirit my brothers and sisters you see that that hole in the roof <laughs> You will, and they took him down through there. Jesus, it says, Jesus saw their great faith and he said to the man, your sins are forgiven. Wow. And immediately, Jesus knew what, the, what this would do because a lot of religious people sitting around him too, listening and watching his every move. So sure enough, they say, how can you say that? Who gave you the right and authority to say such a thing? And that's when Jesus says that other powerful thing. He says, I believe it's in the same chapter where he says, you know, well, the Son of Man has a right and the authority. Okay, make no mistake, I have both. Right and authority, I have the power to heal this man as well as to forgive his sins. And then he says to him, get up and walk, and he does. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going back to Ephesians. Wasn't I in Ephesians 1? Yes, Ephesians 1, uh, verse 13. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the good news, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were stamped with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit as owned and protected. You are his. So now you can be, as, as just as I am, you can be in this world. Whatever I have is yours. Come on. The Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. Nothing else glorifies our Lord except when his sons realize their inheritance in him. Nothing else. Yeah. So you're saying, oh, you know, I honor, I want to honor God. And, you know, I want to be so pious and I want to do all these things to please him. No, this is what pleases him. You knowing who you are in Christ and why you have the Spirit of God who rose him from the dead, why he lives on the inside of you, you understanding this and, and your inheritance in him and, and taking advantage of that 
is what glorifies him. The spirit is the guarantee of your inheritance. For this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may grant you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation. Revelation into the true knowledge of him. Why is he praying this? Why is he saying this right now after saying all of this? You need the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Why is he saying that? You, my brother and sister, you need conviction. Do you understand? Conviction uh, means that you've seen. You've seen something. The light bulb has gone off. Conviction gives the substance to the things that you're hoping for. Conviction is the evidence of the unseen things. It's that, it's that I know that I know that I know. Have you ever spoken to somebody who has great conviction of some things? Can you ever change their mind? It doesn't matter what you do, what you say. Their minds are not changed. They are they have a strong conviction of who they are and what they have in Christ. All right. So you can debate them all day, all night. That won't change their mind about it. They are totally at peace. Sometimes it comes across as, oh, well, they're just arrogant. They're stubborn. No, that's conviction. When your mind is renewed with the truth, you will stop saying things like, oh, you know, I'm going to try really hard to do all the right things so that God will be pleased with me, so that God will love me. No, you will, you will start living from the place of that, that knowledge of, I'm loved. Man, I can't believe he loves me like that. Big difference. Same thing when it comes to healing, deliverance, breakthrough, everything, all those things. You, you know, you're not struggling, trying to earn these things. You're saying, no, no, th these things, they belong to me as a child of God. You have the conviction of the things unseen. You know, now you're going to see it. You're going to see it. You're not going to be begging God for provisions, but because you know, no, I'm, I have conviction that my heavenly father, he is going to provide everything for me. His children will not beg for bread really pray that you you receive the power to know what is yours and use it and may you not shift your focus from the hope of the gospel the gospel of peace the gospel of power the power of god itself amen thank you lord I just pray that from this day forth yesterday i talked about your words can't just be saying, oh, I love God, I trust God, yet your words are like, you know, whining, complaining, and you're talking bad about other people and about the situations in your life. That's not okay. That is evidence that mm, something has not changed. <laughs> All right. I just pray from this day forth, your mind will be renewed. You'll see the truth. And every word that comes out of your mouth, every declaration that you make, all right, you will make as an oracle of God. Oracles of God have seen God. They know what they're, what they're talking about. They're not just spitting out a bunch of random words because it sounds religious or because they heard sister so-and-so pray that way, so they're going to repeat the same thing. No, they, they, they speak with conviction. I pray that over you. I'm also going to declare this one thing today, all right? Thank you, Father. I really believe this strongly, that this coming fall, I declare this, all right? With strong conviction in my heart, I declare this because I'm seeing this in my spirit as well, that you will... First of all, you will see a tremendous change on the inside of you, okay? And all those things that have been delayed so long, you're going to see these things break out. Do you understand? Shut doors are going to open. I pray this. I declare this over you. In fact, by faith, I want you all to go look up, type in Google, first day of fall, 2024. Find out what that day is, all right? And you wait and see. Watch. Watch and pray watch and pray i'll say that to you again watch and pray write down that date and watch and pray this fall you are going to see this thank you lord jesus this present suffering that you're experiencing it is nothing it's just a momentary affliction you will see these things lose their power their grip over your life and as those guys did you will go where he is you, you will go where Jesus is. You will follow him the rest of your life. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Uh, I also need to go to Colossians. And then there's a few more scriptures I want to highlight. Today's morning devotion is going to be slightly longer. Um, my son is over here in the same room with me. He's just doing some coloring. So I'm able to do slightly longer recording today. And, and this was just burning in my heart. So I need to get this out. Colossians. Let's go. Okay, I'm going to read from verse 6. Colossians 1 verse 6. Indeed, just as in the whole world, the gospel is constantly bearing fruit and spreading 
just as it has been doing among you ever since the day you have you first heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth. For this reason, since the day we heard about it, we have not stopped praying for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. This is my prayer for you as well. This is the same thing I read, remember, from Ephesians. May you be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and in understanding so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. So that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all things, bearing fruit in every good work and steadily growing in the knowledge of God. This is what I was talking about yesterday. I said the same thing. Praise the Lord. And even the other day, I said, don't get accustomed to these things that's happening in your life. You don't, don't get too used to God coming to save you every time. Oh, oh no, oh, you got a little boo-boo again? Okay, let me help you out again. Listen, if he has done that for you, it's because he's a merciful, loving God. Do you understand? But does he want you to remain in that place? No. He wants us to grow. Okay? I'm not saying, oh, you. Uh, he wants you to go to the point where you wouldn't need him all the time. No, 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 no. Your dependence on the Lord will keep on steadily growing. Okay? But you grow as well you grow as a person you grow in in all your knowledge of god you gain clear insight on so many things that you didn't previously have this is what will change your life amen strengthened and invigorated with all power that's verse 11 according to his glorious might Thank you, Lord, to attain every kind of endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. There is an inheritance of his saints in the light with the capital L. Who is that light in Christ? Amen. This is so exciting. Watch this. So that you may attain every kind of endurance and patience with joy. Same thing you read about in Hebrews 12. He endured patiently because of the joy that was set before him. That's how he endured the cross. That's what you're reading right here in Colossians 1.11. That you also may attain every kind of endurance and patience with joy. Jesus was able to do what he did in the same way. And what was the result of that? Salvation. Jesus accomplished what he came to do. And then he seated at the right hand of the father and you are now seated in him with god he has rescued us and has drawn us to himself from the dominion of darkness and has transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son he's exact living image of the unseen god by him all things were created in heaven and on earth visible and invisible all things were created and exist through him all things were created and exist through him and for him. Through him and for him. That includes you. Through him and for him. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. I can I can keep going on there. But uh, I also wanted to share this from, this will be the last couple of verses that I read. Second Corinthians. All right. 12 is powerful as well, where he talks about my grace is sufficient for you. God speaks to uh, uh, Paul and tells him, my grace is sufficient for you. Amen. I've, I've taught on this before as well. My power is being perfected in your weakness. Oh, thank you, Lord. But I want to highlight uh, chapter 13. Second Corinthians chapter 13. Look at verse 3. He is, talking about Christ, he is not weak or ineffective in dealing with you, but powerful within you. Do you believe that? Christ in you, the hope of glory, right? Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is not inefficient or ineffective or weak in dealing with you, but he is powerful within you. You need to understand this so you can stop living with your, you know, your like hiding and just trying to try and defend, trying to track the devil and people and everybody and yourself and everything is out to get you and, and, and whatever. And blaming things, blaming situations, blaming people for everything. And you're holding yourself back. Watch this. Even though he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by the power of God. For we too are weak in him, yet we are alive and well with him because of the power of God directed towards you. He's not weak and he's not ineffective in dealing with you, but he's powerful within you. 
God's power is directed towards you. Greater is he who lives in you than he who was in the world. This power directed towards you is great. It's immeasurable. It is great and it is immeasurable. It is directed towards you and it comes out of you. Test and evaluate yourselves to see whether you are in the faith and living your lives as believers. Examine yourselves. Or do you not re recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test and are rejected as counterfeit? But I hope you will acknowledge that we do not fail the test, nor are we to be rejected. I pray, everybody who is here, that you will be comforted by his presence, that you will live in peace. Thank you, Lord, that you will walk closely with your God and the God of love and peace will be with you. He will be with you. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. All right. I'm going to stop here for today because I don't want this to get too long, but I will see you all tomorrow. Have a beautiful day. All right.